Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Foreign Policy Virtual Dialogue, Clean Energy Innovation in partnership with ClearPath. My name is Allison Carlson, and I'm the Managing Director of FP Analytics, Foreign Policy's Research and Advisory Division. And it's my pleasure to be your host for the next hour. We're here today to talk about investment in clean energy technologies as a strategy for economic recovery here in the US while also supporting global climate targets and energy resilience around the world. Our guests today will help us explore whether and how the dual goal of job growth and a transition to clean energy sources can be achieved. We'll explore questions about the need that are needed from government, finance, and industry to help spur and support growth in this sector. And we'll also explore how the coronavirus amplified the importance of reliable, sustainable energy and how economic recovery legislation might also incentivize clean energy priorities. We've assembled a great panel of both public and private sectors today to help dig into these questions. And a big thank you to ClearPath for partnering with us on this program. First, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. We want to hear from you and we want this to be as engaging as possible. So we've reserved a portion of the program at the end of the session for audience questions, but we'd also like to engage without, excuse me, engage throughout the program. So if you're on Zoom, it's quite easy. If you have a question, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. When you do so, tell us your name, where you're writing from, and be sure to direct your question to a specific speaker. If you're joining us on the phone or by live, live stream, you can also email your questions and you can do so at events at foreignpolicy.com. We also have a hashtag for today. We're using hashtag US clean energy exports. So please chime into the conversation. Again, we want this to be as engaging as possible. So let's get started. First, I'd like to welcome Rich Powell. He's the executive director of ClearPath, a DC-based organization developing and advancing conservative policies that accelerate clean energy innovation. Rich, welcome to the program. Allison, thanks so much for having me and thanks for partnering with us on this event. Yes, thank you so much for joining us today. So Rich, first I'd like to kick off the conversation with a discussion about clean energy as being central to a strategy for economic revitalization. You know, we're at a time where the real economy is really struggling in the midst of COVID-19 and an economic downturn globally. So I'd really like to hear from you and from your perspective, how can clean energy innovation really help to address the risk to the US economy and the financial system in this moment? Well, I think it's such an important question, Allison. Clearly, the energy sector, the global energy sector, has been hit particularly hard by the COVID moment as transportation and electricity use has slowed and decreased around the world. By the same token, though, we've seen uh, that reliable, affordable, clean energy access has never been more important. If we're thinking about combating a global epidemic or recovering from a global epidemic, it's just absolutely essential that we have clean, reliable electricity to keep the air clean in cities and communities that are heavily affected by something like a respiratory illness and to run the HVAC systems and the ventilators in the hospitals and the Wi-Fi that keeps everybody comfortably at home in, in dealing with an epidemic. And so we've really seen the requirement that the globe goes to clean, affordable, reliable electricity as quickly as possible. And that's, that's obviously a public health priority for the world. Uh, and it's a massive economic opportunity for US industry and US exports. And we think the moment is right to seize that, particularly as so much of the world is thinking about electrification and thinking about clean stimulus and recovery as part of their plans. Great, and I'd like to dig into that last point about it being an economic opportunity and challenge you on that a bit. And I'm really curious about your take on this prevailing narrative about there being a choice between economic growth and clean energy and a notion that investment in clean energy and expansion of clean and renewable energy technologies are, are bad for the economy or could potentially be a drag on the economy. Can you speak to that? And is that a false choice? 
we think it can be a false choice. And that's where innovation comes in. So the key in our mind is that the green premium, the extra cost that you have to pay uh, to develop clean energy as opposed to developing traditional energy, we've got to make that as low as possible or, or insignificant altogether. And for many technologies, that green premium has already come down to virtually nothing, right? For, for wind and solar, for example, those have become very affordable technologies, but because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine, they're not the technologies that can power the entirety of a reliable, affordable electric grid for the entire planet. And so we need to decrease the green premium for all of the other innovative technologies that could take us all the way to clean and that could actually provide a real alternative for so much of the world that continues to turn to kind of traditional unmitigated coal technologies for their new build electricity. If you look at what's going up around the world, take Pakistan, for example, with heavy involvement by the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, Pakistan is building out a significant new coal fleet and it's not even using the, the best coal technologies that the United States could offer or that even a country like China could offer. It's using literally the cheapest traditional subcritical coal technologies for that build. And it's locking in, unfortunately, decades of unnecessary emissions, carbon emissions and just local air pollution as it does that build. And so the priority I think for the world is to find those like for like substitutes, those things that actually could go into a a Pakistan or a Nigeria or an Indonesia supply affordable 24 seven reliable electricity and do it in a clean way as opposed to a, a higher emitting way. And so when you talk about that and when you're talking about reliability and deep decarbonization and what's necessary when there are these investments around the world in subcritical coal and other high emission energy generation sources what are some of the other technologies that you think need to be prioritized in terms of both their development here, deployment domestically, and also export abroad? So a, a couple of technologies are key. Uh, first and foremost, advanced nuclear needs to be at or near the top of that list. And I'm just thrilled that you've assembled this incredible group of folks um, on the call today, who are or on, the, on the webinar today, who are gonna be able to discuss uh, all of the possibilities for exports of US nuclear technology as it exists today to countries like Poland with the help of uh, the terrific Export Import Bank um, and, uh, and, and companies like Bechtel that actually know how to build these things. Um, we need to also go the next step and find very advanced reactor designs that no longer use water as the coolant uh, and that can be significantly smaller than the designs that we have and can offer today in the US. In addition to advanced nuclear, other technologies like long duration energy storage that could take all of that low cost wind and solar, but then turn it into a, at first a 24 hour resource and then a seven day a week resource and eventually a, a 365 day a year resource. That's the real challenge of extending that storage to, to, to whole months and seasons. Um, along with technologies that allow us to continue to use fossil fuels, but to do it in a cleaner way. So technologies like carbon capture and storage that would allow us to continue to burn coal and use natural gas, um, particularly exported from the United States, ideally, uh, out to the rest of the world. Uh, and then very advanced technologies like enhanced geothermal and fusion technologies out on the horizon. All of these things need to be part of an innovation portfolio here in the United States. So thinking about that and speaking about nuclear in particular, you know, I think there's a narrative out there and understandably so because of incidents that have happened in the past and a certain thought about also the level of investment that's required for nuclear. Can you talk a little bit about how nuclear technology has changed over the last several years, both in terms of technology, scale, deployability, and also safety and reliability? Absolutely. Well, just to hit that last question, which tends to be the elephant in the room question, the, the safety question, I think we should remember that the new nuclear plants that are being built and the techniques uh, to keep those plants extremely safe and effective are not sort of your, your parents' nuclear technology. The advanced designs and really all the retrofits that were made to the existing designs have ensured that the existing nuclear fleet is actually really the safest way to generate electricity in the entire world at the moment. If you just look at the number of people Unfortunately, that perish every year in our in our global energy supply chain, which is 
you know, not insignificant. And energy is tough and it's tough on people, but nuclear actually has the best track record of safety of any energy technology. So the, those designs are very, very safe. The key is to make them more affordable. And the best demonstrated ways to make them more affordable are first to learn by doing, so simply to build more of them. Uh, the Chinese nuclear offerings have become quite affordable. The Korean nuclear offerings have become quite affordable because they've standardized the design and they've built a number of them. And so we're coming through a very difficult moment of new build nuclear in the United States where we were demonstrating plants for the first of a kind. And obviously those were big, expensive, somewhat painful experiences. But now we have learned so much about how to build these plants. We've redeveloped all those skills in our nuclear workforce and our engineering force and our supply chain. So the key now is to deploy everything we've learned about how to build them and keep doing that more and more so that we can bring down the costs of every additional unit. And then the innovative designs hopefully can provide even a step change after that. If they can be significantly smaller so that even if the unit cost of the electricity is about the same, the overall capital required to build the plants is, is just smaller. So much of the world doesn't need the gigantic gigawatt scale nuclear reactors that we currently are building here in the United States. So much of the world have smaller power grids and need more kind of bite-sized uh, options. Having those offerings as well to, uh, to complement our existing, you know, very large gigawatt scale offerings is also a really important priority. And that's again, where the, where the innovation comes in, demonstrating uh, new smaller reactors that can, that can fill that market niche. Great, that's really helpful. And I think, you know, often when we talk about clean energy deployment, I think a focus is on domestic deployment. And we talk about reduction in emissions, et cetera, and um, clean energy abroad is often in the context of international treaties and agreements, et cetera. So can you talk a little bit about your perspective on the role of clean energy deployment and what is necessary now to really facilitate that domestically to achieve the deep, deep, decarbonization goals and emission reduction goals that we have as well. Sure, treaties and agreements are absolutely important, important but what is the piece regarding technology deployment that's needed there? Sure, so, so, so treaties and agreements are important. It's important to show global leadership. It's important to make sure that the world is, is aligned and moving in the same direction. But what we've seen time and again is that treaties and commitments are too often things that can come and go as the political will for dealing with climate change increases and decreases around the world. The thing that you can't put back into the bottle, so to speak, is technology. When people have newer, better, higher performing, lower cost, cleaner technology, they just keep adopting that, regardless of which way the political will for dealing with a problem like climate change goes. We've seen that here in the United States, if you take the example of shale gas and the shale gas revolution. That was a technology that was developed with heavy involvement from the public sector. The Department of Energy provided cost shares for the first uh, horizontal wells and hydraulic fracturing and diamond headed drill bits and 3D imaging. There was a significant federal tax incentive, the alternative production credit that really helped scale up that technology. And then once that was ready to go and it was shown that uh, producing electricity from shale gas was so much less expensive than many of the alternatives, the market just took off um, with that technology. And in the absence of any mandate or other policy, we made this pretty remarkable transition to, to, to being a primarily gas-fired uh, uh, national power grid, now complemented by ever lower cost renewables as well. So finding that next technology that's so high performing, so clean, and so affordable that the market just takes it up, that's, that seems to be the long-term sustainable way to actually fuel uh, a sustainable transition. Okay. Thanks. That's really helpful. And I want to go back brief question coming in from our audience that I'd really like you to field. Um, it's from Derek Lowe. And he asks specifically with respect to nuclear and the conversations that we were just having, what advancements have been made in nuclear energy technology since Fukushima nearly a decade ago? And are there areas that you can pinpoint where safety, reliability, and security have been enhanced such that there can be greater confidence among the public that it is in fact a safe technology to be deployed in our strategies going forward. 
Absolutely. So in the wake of the Fukushima incident, especially in the United States fleet, the entire fleet was retrofitted and upgraded so that an incident like first, it's very unlikely a Fukushima type incident could ever previously have happened in the US fleet. But specifically to resolve those issues, the entire fleet went through a significant upgrade to remove that possibility of the of the backups going under something like a like a flooding event like that um, sort of ever taking place. And so that, that eventuality is effectively off the table really for all global nuclear designs. Um, now that we know that's an issue. Some of the more advanced reactor concepts as well have additional features that I think should give folks even more confidence that we can produce the same safety results at, at ever lower cost and, and greater reliability. Uh, those are things like passive safety features. So the plants effectively shut themselves off as opposed to having to have some kind of a human intervention to shut the, to shut the designs off. Also the smaller reactors just have a lot less material in those reactors. Uh, and often that material is not under so much pressure like with existing light water systems. And so uh, those two things combined mean that if there was some kind of an event you, there's no risk of that event causing some kind of a, you know, a, a release of material. And even if the material was released, there's so much less material in the reactor that it's, it's really less of a concern and less of an issue. So um, there have been just great leaps on all this to, to take what was already an extremely safe system. We should remember that the Fukushima event, there was a, there was a great loss of life due to a tsunami, but virtually no loss of life due to the actual nuclear reaction that followed. The fleet's already quite safe. It's taken great steps forward, um, and uh, and I think you know it, it, especially given the risks of climate change that we're trying to um, you know uh, weigh off here against deployment of these technologies. I think you know they're pretty minuscule relative to uh, you know what 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 may be the risks of uh, of a changing climate. Sure, thank you. And one other question coming in from the audience about other technologies and renewables in particular. So Emma Cohen asks, in talking about additional renewables technologies, you didn't mention biofuels. Under the rubric of replacing fossil fuels with similar performing fuels, wouldn't biogas be something we should invest in expanding our capacity? Given you know, the evolution of biofuels and bio-based energy over the last decade plus, um, how would you respond to that? Yeah. Well, 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 first of all, I, I would just just slightly challenge the notion of Emma's question, which is I don't think we should be talking about replacing fossil fuels. I think we should be talking about eliminating the emissions from all fuels. We could continue to use fossil fuels forever if there were no emissions from those fuels. And so I think that's just a, a first note I should make. But I do think that other other uh, sources of fuel like biogas could be really important uh, substitutes and complements to continued use of fossil fuels, and because of the way that those uh, that the, that the uh, biomass uh, feedstocks for those take CO two out of the air uh, as we're as we're building those things up, they are a lower emitting um, source. Most of the analysis done, for example, of the U.S. grid, though, shows that that can be only a small part of the solution. So we're going to have to think about all kinds of different clean fuels in the future. There'll be biogas, there'll be hydrogen, there'll be hydrogen made from natural gas and made from biological sources and probably made from nuclear energy and renewable energy. So it's really going to be a, a portfolio of different low carbon fuels, not just any one that I think are going to be able to uh, eliminate the emissions from the system. Okay. Great, thank you so much. I have so many more questions from you and others that are coming in from the audience. But right now we need to move on to our next panel, but we will have you back at the end of this program for our audience question and answer period as well. So thank you so much, Rich, for helping us at the stage for the conversation. And we'll see you again in a bit. And thanks again to Path for supporting the program and joining us today. We really appreciate it. So now we want to turn to Congress to explore how policymakers can most effectively tailor support for domestic clean energy innovation and its role in strengthening US energy security and competitiveness, both domestically and abroad. So now I'm pleased to welcome to the program, Senator Kevin Kramer, Republican from North Dakota. Senator Kramer has introduced and supported legislation in support of American leadership in nuclear energy development and exports. Welcome, Senator. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Allison. Thanks for the opportunity. It's, it's great to be with you. And uh, we're a little frazzled here because we're in the middle of a vote, <laughs> of course, right? Schedule something and you'll have a vote. Um, the good news is I voted and I'm, I'm back. So just appreciate the, uh, the patience and, uh, and, and the great use of technology. So I'm anxious for the discussion and 
grateful for the opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you so much for rushing over here to join us. Again, we really appreciate your time. Um, I know it's incredibly valuable right now. So thank you. And always, thank you so much again for joining us. It's not any more valuable than, than yours, quite no. honestly, and, and, and not any more valuable than this topic. So I'm, again, I'm grateful for the opportunity. So let's dive in. And I'd like to dovetail off of a comment that Rich just made regarding affordability. And you've been a vocal propon a proponent of affordable clean energy and that rule over the previous clean power plan. So I'd like to dive in there and especially as we're looking toward the future and you know what types of legislation will help the US be most competitive and really invest in renewable energy going forward. And so I'd like to ask you, how does the ACE rule um, place U.S. clean energy technology in a more competitive position domestically and globally than other legislation has has done so previously? Sure. No, it's a great question and a great point because you know, prior to becoming a member of Congress, you know, my, before my terms in the House, um, I was a public service commissioner in North Dakota, you know, a, a rate regulator as well as a site regulator and environmental regulator, and had to consider lots of things when it came to particularly electricity rates, um, and natural gas rates uh, for, for retail customers. And so how the ACE, how ACE, you know, the advantage ACE has in terms of competitiveness is that it's not so prescriptive. Um, the clean power plan, as you know, was very prescriptive in the technologies that it, that it required, um, which, is, which is why it was remanded back. It's why the EPA was out of its lane. And, you know, one of the advantages to ACE hopefully will be that it's deemed constitutional and that it doesn't have that st strong pushback from, this, from sovereign states um, or, or, or industries. It, also the thing about prescribing a technology or s prescribing a solution to the challenge um, is that you really chase capital away. Um, while you might maybe pick a winner for, for capital attraction, you chase the innovators away um, and the capital away from the innovators. And so, so for me, I just think that, that that's a big part. The other part of it, Allison, is that, that according to pretty much all an, an analysis of the clean power plan, it was cause um, you know, rates to increase, electricity rates, for example. And anytime the cost of energy increases, at a, whether it's a, at a state or a country, um, it makes their competitors, competitors more competitive and you less competitive. So, uh, you know, my, my position generally is don't prescribe the solution. Just get out of the way of the innovators. Don't kill the innovators. And the solutions will come as part of the free market and you're going to have a greater menu of solutions. And so for me, that was, that was really one of the, the, the biggest objections. Now, also, of course, as a state regulator, regulator I found it offensive that uh, the federal government would impose um, things on my decision-making that, that, that uh, you know, that I didn't have at the state level, the sovereignty that the constitution affords me. So there's both the philosophical, larger philosophical issue, and then the more practical uh, issue of cost and competitiveness. And, and I just think ACE is a, is a much better way to go. Okay, thank you. And thinking about cost and competitiveness and priorities going forward, and also the moment that we're in and a real need to focus on revitalization of the US economy, investment in mm -hmm. local domestic manufacturing, et cetera. How do you see clean energy fitting into that? And what are your priorities as a member of Congress going forward, both in terms of establishment of incentives and other supports to really expedite and support further development domestically and abroad? Yeah, boy. So, so therein lies the real opportunity with the challenge, in my view. And if I might just step back a little bit um, and, and speak to the political situation, I, you know, I was pretty optimistic two years ago during a divided government, that it would be a good time <laughs> to do some big things because everybody wants something and nobody gets everything they want without, you know, without compromising and negotiating with the other team. Uh, I I've been deeply disappointed, frankly, over those two years that the divided government didn't work better, particularly in the area of energy and technology and innovation. And, but I think one of the reasons for that was everybody was new to this, that this new regime, if you will, 
and some people probably overplayed their leverage. I'd say pretty clearly in the case of the Speaker Pelosi, she, while she has the hardest job in America, in my view, <laughs> and I understand the power that a, a, a faction of the majority party has, because um, I saw it on our side for six years in the House and, and with great frustration, she's been dealing with that. But she overplayed her leverage and we didn't get a lot done. I think the way things are shaping up right now after the la this, this most recent election, and you, you know, again, I'm speaking as a Republican, if the Georgia race, either, either one or both of the Georgia races go our way, I actually think our opportunity as a Congress to get to some solutions is enhanced by the divided government, especially the closely divided government, because regardless of what anybody says, there are no mandates in this last election. The only thing that's clear is we have a very divided country. So what's our role as, as policymakers as, and as leaders? And I think our role is to try to find not just common ground, but create some common ground by, um, by giving a little to get a little. So what that means to, in, in terms of the question, I think it goes back to sort of building off of my last answer. And that is from an incentive standpoint, let's first of all, have a good economy. Let's just have a good, strong, growing economy. Domestic demand will always help the supply. It'll always help the innovator come up with a solution. That's what entrepreneurship does. W with regard to um, incentives, I think the biggest thing we should do is get rid of all the incentives, or at least level the playing field for everybody. So whether it's, you know, prescribing a particular technology, like say carbon capture utilization storage, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, this is, op you know, this, this photo back here is, is the Milton Young station in North Dakota, which is, of course, the uh, participating in Operation Tundra. And I've seen the, the borings now out there and, and there's a lot of promise, but, but, but prescribing a solution that isn't commercially viable just means you're gonna kill that innovation, especially in a competitive situation like, like we have with natural gas and, and, and the, the role it plays. So I think a, a big part of it is let's not, pick, let's not pick the winners. I don't like to say pick the winners and losers. Let's just not pick the winners and then there doesn't have to be losers. Then the marketplace can come up with the solution and capital can follow um, you know, the innovation and, and, and hopefully the innovators can attract that. So for me, it's about doing less, not doing more in terms of incentives. Now we're gonna be confronted, no doubt, it's probably in the next month or so with the tax extenders, either as a package, more likely as, you know, as part of a, a spending bill and maybe none of the above happens, I don't know. But I, I really think we have to take a hard look at all of that and, and just sort of ramp down the rhetoric and just find a level playing field. Um, with regard to even, you know, I appreciated the discussion about, um, about they were just having about uh, liquid fuels for automobiles and in emissions for automobiles. There's another case where let's just, let's just focus on the goal, not prescribe the technologies, not incent uh, an, an oversupply of ethanol or biofuels or, or, an, or, or an undersupply of oil or whatever the case might be. But let's, let's let you know, let's let the market work by providing just again some some basic incentives for emission standards or you know um, vehicle um, you know efficiencies and, and, and work that path, and then the market can work much much better. On the on the global side, I think that that it just stands to reason that it follows. First of all, remembering that even you know the, our country is twenty percent of the world's economy, so it's not like we're insignificant. And we oftentimes forget about the power of our own economy and our own consumption. But on the on the global stage, I think America's edge, and this is why I love Clear Path. This is why I love this discussion. America's edge has always been innovation. It's always been where we we lead, but we have to be on the stage to lead. And um, I, th I don't think there's any secret to, you know, to you all that, um, you know, this is an area, the, the Paris Climate Accord, for example, was an area where I you know, disagreed with our president. I disagreed with him from the day he took office. And I, you know, did my part to try and persuade him to stay in Paris, you know, work from the, a leadership position at the table on certainly, again, leveling some playing fields, making sure that, um, you know, we have fair standards, uh, but then, lead by demonstrating our goodwill and our innovation. And uh, I, I just think we're a lot better off that way. I'd much rather, I know I'm a member of the Armed Services Committee as well as the Environment and Public Works Committee. And I'd ra much rather spend, um, use the peaceful tools of, of innovation and energy development 
in, than the than the weapons of war. And so, I, without going into a lot of discussion on the national security front, although I'm glad to if you'd like, I just think that we have an opportunity. And, and frankly, I think in a in a Biden administration, if that's what we end up with, um, and I think that's likely, by the way. Um, I think we have an opportunity if we get back in Paris to, to do two things. One, put America in, in a stronger position with the accord and to uh, be more of an ombudsman and, and uh, marketing tool, if you will, for American innovation. And I think that's good for the, the world as well as for our country. If I can jump in on that point real mm -hmm. quickly and talking about you know, a portfolio approach of multiple technologies being required mm -hmm. to really advance our energy goals, both in terms of energy security and supporting energy, clean energy development domestically as well. Are there some concrete areas where you could see collaboration with a uh, Biden administration to achieve those collective objectives? Yeah, so interesting question because <laughs> I'm unapologetic about politics. <laughs> Those of you who know me are not, wouldn't be surprised by that. But I'm also very pragmatic about moving an agenda forward. I don't necessarily feel the need to spend a lot of time collaborating as much as um, just opening up, opening up the whole field to all of the innovators. And that, I don't, that don't mean that to sound like I'm not interested in working with the administration, um, I, because I have to work with the administration, whoever they are. Our founders had this thing figured out. Thank God they were smarter than, than we are today, and, and because we have this wonderful opportunity of three co-equal branches and two, you know, two, two um, chambers. Um, and, and so we're forced to work together. So, but some concrete areas, I'll give you one, for example, let, let, getting back again to the, 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 um, the goal should be the goal, not, not the prescription. So if we, can, if we can settle on some reasonable goals, agree that we want you know, more clean energy, fewer emissions, come up with uh, you know, some reasonable uh, go attainable goals, which the United States doesn't have a lot to apologize for in that area. Um, but if we apply our goals and our, our standards at a global level, then I think we, you know, we can play in the game. But many of the same people who, who don't want to see carbon capture, or utilization, storage, um, you know, th their issue isn't so much um, the solution as it is what, this, what you know, the technology is prescribed for the solution. Um, there's always nuclear. And I've been, as you know, I think you said up front, I've been a strong proponent of nuclear. I mean, to me, nuclear is the perfect, it's the perfect uh, fuel. Uh, and I come from a big coal state. You use the word portfolio up front. Portfolio is not that interesting to me. I don't, I, if you have the perfect fuel, why do you need a whole bunch of others that are less perfect as long as you have enough of the, you know, an abundant supply of the one? I know that sounds like almost heretical to some people, but but if you just track with me a little bit, I just, that's why I think you, you, you set the goals, whether it's an emission standard, probably an emission standard of some sort with some, you know, trailing goals as uh, tailing goals as we go out, much like everyone talks about. The problem is they want it to be done their way. But if we just set those goals and then level the playing field, um, we can do a whole lot with both fossil fuels and with energy or with nuclear and with the renewables and, and, and you know, like, like wind and solar, um, you know, with cars, hydrogen, there's something you never talk about. You know, you, you, you have one side of the political aisle that wants to do all electric cars by, you know, 2030, but they ignore other, other uh, efficiencies and fuels that, that uh, are just as good, if not better, and get to, to zero or near zero emissions. That's what I mean by the portfolio ought to just be everything in the marketplace and then let the marketplace decide which of those things it likes and let capital follow it. Um, so I, you know, but, but again, politics is the art of the possible and with a divided government, we, you know, I think we work with the administration. One thing I am not is I'm not a hell no, I won't go guy. I rarely say what I'll never do, <laughs> very few exceptions. Um, because again, our founders were geniuses and they made sure that uh, we could function as a divided government because we're self-governed. And right now we're being governed by um, what, what, what is it roughly uh, um, 150 million people and split nearly down the middle. So that means we're gonna have to find solutions that both agree with. And, and then as people of persuasion, not just people, not just representatives of people that persuade us and make no mistake, we are a reflection of those 150 million voters. 
and the 300 plus million people that they all represent. Um, but we're more a reflection of them than they are of us. But every now and then, because we're in the positions we're in and because people listen, because we have a circle of influence, we have to do our part as well to explain why a nuclear is you know, a, a good, a strong, viable option for lots of reasons, why clean coal technology really can exist if we don't kill the innovators, and then explain to our, our other um, stakeholders why we needed to, to give on the things that we gave on, whether it's, a, you know, production tax credit or some other incentive um, to, in order to get these other things that we need. And that's just, that's frankly, and forgive me, and I hope my colleagues would forgive me, that's just us needing to be less lazy. That's us as policymakers also stepping up and being leaders and being willing to confront these issues and talk about them rather than sort of gravitate to the lowest common denominator. So right. I, I, I didn't mean to give a lecture. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. And really appreciate your leadership on this issue and others, both in terms of investing in clean technologies for growth and competitiveness in the U.S., but also abroad. And as you state as well, it takes a number of actors to be able to do that from the public, from the private sector as well. And I know you've been a big supporter of Exim Bank and the reauthorization and other efforts to really promote and support clean technologies going forward. So thank you for that. And thank you for your leadership. And thanks again for joining us today. Unfortunately, we'll need to move on to the next panel, but again, really appreciate your time and your leadership on all of these issues. So thank you well, very no. much. And thank, and thank you for yours. Everything going forward as well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for yours and thanks for uh, being a friend and for giving me this opportunity to share. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye. And now on to the next segment of our program. I'm really excited to welcome an illustrious panel of leaders and experts who will help us address um, the clean energy market from a business, geopolitical, and international finance point of view as well. And I think this really stems well from the conversation that we've just had with Rich Powell as well as Senator Kramer. And so now I would like to welcome to the conversation Kimberly Reed, President and Chairman of the Export Import Bank of the US, Peter Namsky, Poland's Minister of Energy and Secretary of State for Strategic Energy Infrastructure, and Brendan Bechtel, who's the Chairman and CEO of the Bechtel Group, an American engineering and procurement construction and project management company. Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for being here. And Minister Nyamski, I'd like to start off with you. And you now we've focused quite a bit so far on opportunities for US, the US, domestic infrastructure development, and also now wanting to bridge a bit more into a discussion about international collaboration for clean energy technology deployment. And in July, um, just a few months ago, as you all know, the International Development Finance Corporation or the DFC lifted restriction, restrictions on nuclear exports. And this really precipitated and allowed a landmark agreement between the US and Poland. And just a month or, month or so ago, I believe on October 19th, an agreement was signed between the US and Poland to that end to collaborate on civil nuclear energy technology and innovation. And I'd really like to turn to you to kick off this conversation so you can talk with us in our audience a bit about the key considerations behind Poland's nuclear power program and why Poland chose to work with the US on this effort and this initiative. Um, could you give us your thoughts ab about that and, and a little insight into your strategy? Thank you very much. And uh, it's a real pleasure you know, to be uh, with the most important uh, person from uh, Exim Bank and from uh, Bechtel Company uh, on the panel. Uh, all right, we are confronting in Poland a uh, big challenge, big challenge, which is the necessity to transform our energy sector and uh, uh, transform it from coal-based uh, uh, energy production to, uh, let's say, uh, green or greenish uh, uh, world. Uh, we started in uh, 
early 90s with the more than 90% of our energy produced from coal, either lignite or hard coal. Now uh, it is uh, around 70, 70%. And uh, uh, we are European country. We have to comply with uh, European uh, strategies on uh, uh, climate, uh, uh, on uh, energy, and uh, it seems that uh, Poland is the country where this transition will be the most difficult in Europe, because there is no other European country with uh, such a uh, amount of uh, energy produced uh, uh, with uh, dirty coal, <laughs> uh, if I may say. Uh, so uh, we have uh, ahead of us uh, probably 20, 30, 40 years of transformation. Uh, we do have Silesia region, which is coal region, and uh, for many reasons, but also for social and economic reasons, we are not able to switch, you know, from Monday to Tuesday, uh, the, uh, 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 the um, pattern, uh, economic pattern there. So, in our strategy, we are going to rely on uh, uh, fast growth of renewables, which is, uh, which is uh, onshore and offshore wind, which is photovoltaic. And uh, by 40, uh, 45, we'll have uh, uh, really, uh, uh, you know, uh, starting from uh, 2.5, probably gigawatts in the photovoltaic today, we'll have more than 20 gigawatts in photovoltaic, and we'll have probably teens, uh, 15, 17, gigawatts on, uh, on offshore wind. But we have a, a number of uh, 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 blocks uh, based on coal, and we are going to phase them out uh, with time. And this has to be replaced. This has to be replaced with stable production because renewables, they need backup. They need backups. Uh, Still, we don't have, uh, uh, in the near foreseeable future, we don't have uh, uh, enough technologies for efficient large scale storages, energy storages. So we are looking uh, and for, uh, for uh, uh, backup for those uh, renewables. And this is nuclear. And this is nuclear because uh, nuclear is a clean uh, source of energy, base load, stable energy product, production, uh, secure. And uh, this is why we decided in Poland that we should have in, let's say, 20 years, because this is 20 years program, 20, uh, 20 25 years program, and we'll have six to nine gigawatts in, uh, in nuclear. We decide to start with large scale reactors because we need them uh, as fast as possible, as soon as possible, which means that uh, we, we would like to have, you know, first in 2033 and the last, uh, let's say, mid-40s, uh, and we need a partner. We need partner, stable partnership for this program, we are looking for such a partner, we are looking for technology, which is uh, uh, not first of the kind, but probably second or probably third of the kind, but uh, so proven. Uh, we need experience, uh, which uh, will be possible to be, take, uh, uh, to be taken to Poland uh, with, uh, with our uh, partners. We need partner not only for uh, construction phase, we are looking for partner for operational phase up to the commission of those uh, reactors, which means that we are talking about 60, 80 years of partnership, which is something new, which is uh, kind of a new approach. And those uh, uh, events you mentioned in the United States, they, they uh, give us uh, uh, hope 
that it could be a partnership with American companies, with American government. We are we we did not decide yet about technology. We did not decide about partnership. Uh, we have a year ahead of us, one year or 18 months, and this is what is written in this agreement you mentioned, because uh, uh, American companies, uh, with the assistance of, uh, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, American government, DOE specifically, but, but not only, uh, in cooperation with our company in Poland, will prepare uh, uh, front and uh, early uh, uh, scheme for such a program. And the Polish government will decide uh, uh, by end of next year, uh, finally, the, uh, the, uh, the final choice will be, will be, to, will be decided. Uh, we, we have to remember that we have to work uh, on this project inside European Union and Euratom. And we have to comply, and we are going to comply with every uh, regulations uh, which are uh, upon us. Uh, this uh, agreement with which was signed, you mentioned, was uh, notified with Euratom. I think I have to stop here uh, now. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, because, so much. You know, this is, and this is a major, I mean, basic scope for, for the program. Right. And thank you so much for your comments on that. And it's such an exciting collaboration and landmark agreement for furthering cooperation on clean energy between the US and other countries around the world. And I think that's actually a perfect segue into a conversation for Chairman Reed um, and talking about opportunities for greater collaboration for clean energy exports um, and collaboration on clean energy around the world. And so Chairman Reed, I'd like to turn it over to you. I know after about five years of limbo or so, um, <laughs> last year, Congress passed the reauthorization of the XM Bank um, for seven years, which is the longest in history. So I'd love to turn to you and ask if you can speak for a moment about the importance of this reauthorization and its long term and the critical role that XM is playing in supporting clean energy exports in particular and the opportunities for greater international collaboration abroad. Absolutely, and it's so nice to be with you. And uh, Minister Nimsky, I just wanna show you something. I don't know if you can see who gave this to me, but uh, our US ambassador um, to Poland, uh, Georgette Mosbacher, and uh, I was with her um, in Luxembourg in September at something called the September Summit where US ambassadors from Europe gathered to talk about important topics of the day. And uh, I presented uh, what we're gonna talk about um, today in part. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that uh, Ambassador Mossbacher is very eager for me to come to your country and get some deals done. We want you buying great made in the USA goods and Ambassador services. Ambassador Mosbacher, if I may say, is really very helpful. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's absolutely, and it's great to be with you, uh, Brendan. Uh, Exim has long supported uh, great companies like Bechtel, and I can't tell you how thrilled I am uh, to be the first woman in first West Virginian to lead uh, the Export Import Bank in its 86 year history. Um, uh, uh, I'm in my office today overlooking the White House, and uh, as you know, Exxon was closed for about four years because of congressional issues, nothing to do with me, and finally President Trump um, gave the final push, and I watched the deal being cut uh, to get uh, me confirmed in a strong bipartisan basis, and for us to get our export credit agency reopened and regoing and reformed, and Allison, as you mentioned, um, as part of that, um, last year, the president came out really strong and said, I want Exim to be around for a long time. He called for a 10 year reauthorization of our agency, which I loved. We worked really hard and Congress came back with seven years, which is the longest tenure in Exim's uh, history. And why is this important? Um, there are 115 export credit agencies around the world. And uh, we were gone for four years. The world transformed a lot. China 
uh, is very aggressive with their export credit agencies. And so this, this reauthorization um, basically gave us uh, the mandate to go forth in very strong ways, inclu including um, in renewable energy. And, uh, and so um, uh, we're very excited as part of that new congressional mandate. Uh, there are two sections. And if you go to XM's website and you look at our charter, I specifically put at the top a placeholder um, for this new legislation that was passed last December. So you can read those, um, those various sections. And so I wanna point all of those interested in uh, renewables to look at uh, uh, section 402 and 407. And so we're here to support projects that have a reasonable assurance of repayment, uh, uh, but we really care about renewables. And uh, we have very advantageous uh, repayment tenors for both renewals and nuclear projects. And that's a uh, minister of, I wanna come, come see you in Poland and talk about nuclear projects. Um, but we can provide the long-term financing of up to 18 years at a very competitive interest rate that reduces the cost for these technologies for developing markets. And I also know that the US Department of Energy plays a critical role in the research and development in the in promotion of cutting edge US technology, but it's the US private sector uh, that creates uh, ready-made solar wind energy um, storage, mini grids and micro grids and other technologies. So we're really uh, up and running. I'm so happy that uh, um, earlier this year, um, we were able to vote on a renewable uh, energy project, a $91.5 million transaction that supports a rural electrification project in Senegal. It supports 500 US jobs across 14 states. And this project is a great example, is expected to bring electricity to approximately 330 Senegalese in more than 400 villages and will advance uh, our congressional mandate for renewable energy, as well as uh, our priority uh, support for small businesses. Uh, so in this case, it's a company called Welly, Weldy Lamont in Prospect, Illinois. So we, we really want the world to buy made in the USA goods and services, and uh, we hope Poland will. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your emphasis as well and your point about small businesses and job creation. I think that is obviously such a, a core focus in this moment as the economy is struggling to recover and wonderful to hear that is front and center of your priorities going forward as part of the XM Bank, as well as policymakers in general. And having that perspective, it would be great to bring in Brendan right now from a private sector perspective as well. Understanding that these projects require such collaboration between the public and the private sector to really get them off the ground and make them a reality. So Brendan, if I could turn to you now and ask you from your perspective and where you sit and the projects that Bechtel is involved in, what are you seeing as some of the key challenges, but also real opportunities for aligning these objectives that we've been discussing today regarding supporting clean energy innovation, reducing carbon emissions, and also the need to spur economic recovery and job growth? Yeah, thanks, Allison. And again, it's such an honor to be on with the minister and, and with Kim. Um, you know, I'll, I'll answer this. And then since this is a foreign policy focused panel, I might also just offer a few words on behalf of the private sector for what policymakers can be thinking about specifically to, to stimulate this. So broadly speaking, even before COVID, we were seeing sustainability already being a bigger driver for investors. We're providing the capital that our customers are investing. Obviously, awareness and attention to climate and resilience have grown significantly. I think the pandemic has accelerated that. That's what we're seeing. Um, we expect to see policymakers around the world prioritizing stimulus that helps drive progress on these issues while also obviously focusing on jobs and boosting economic recovery. Uh, the IEA has an interesting analysis that shows that, um, that governments directly or indirectly drive roughly 70% of global energy investments, which is why I wanna take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about the role of policymakers in stimulating that growth. But so you kind of add all that up and there's a really historic opportunity today for governments to thoughtfully steer those investments onto a more sustainable path. Um, obviously from our perspective, uh, from the private sector broadly, predictability, line of sight, visibility, those are all key considerations. 
So uh, one of the important challenges from our perspective would be to keep the focus on quantitatively based strategies that deliver the greatest benefits based on the most efficient allocation of resources. So, you know, advice number one for policymakers, if they're willing to listen to it, would be to follow the data uh, to determine how to meet their energy requirements. Each policymaking environment or jurisdiction has its own constraints and, and realities. Um, but try to meet your energy requirements while reducing emissions in both the short and long term. And that's why it really warmed my heart to hear the minister talking about, you know, this is not a this is not even a 10 year decision. This is a 30, 40, 100 year set of decisions and agreements that we're forming because that's absolutely the right way to think about it based on our own 122 year experience. Um, this also, when I talk about policymakers, I also think that financial policymakers and regulators are playing an important role to make sure that the right deals go forward. Um, just a couple other comments on policy making unsolicited advice generally, I would say first, it's been such a pleasure to be working with Kim as a partner um, and an advocate. I mean, she's just been role modeling the kind of commercial advocacy for Team USA that we, that we um, are so grateful to have. And so I wanna thank Kim for her incredible leadership at Exim. I wanna thank the minister for recognizing the potential value that a Team USA solution could provide to Poland and its energy future. But I, I gotta say in the energy sector broadly, US companies, we tend to be competing more against other countries and other firms. So in the international nuclear energy market specifically, you know, our biggest competitors are state-owned enterprises from countries like Russia and China. Uh, when they advocate for their national companies, they bring an integrated whole of government approach. Now there are certain aspects of, of our vibrant democracy that prevent us from having such a well integrated whole of government approach, but we'd, we'd love to see more of that. Um, if we wanna have a winning Team USA, we need a, a winning Team USA strategy with all the agencies that touch this, like Exxon, DFC, USTDA, MCC, USAID, Commerce, State, et cetera, everybody kind of singing from the same sheet of music. Um, if we had the same kind of comprehensive support that, that our, our strategic competitor countries provide, whether that's loans, equity grants, commercial support, that could really be a game changer. I think Poland's a great real live example we have right now where you know Bechtel and Westinghouse are collaborating with the US government agencies like Kim's and with our with the Polish utility and with the minister's support to develop new nuclear plants. Um, right now, you know, there's a need for early stage feasibility engineering financing so that then the government can take the decisions that the minister talked about and formally request or apply for larger project financing commitments. Um, we've been talking a lot about nuclear. So the other kind of example I put in people's mind to think about for balance is helping US compete in more traditional energy sectors. So for example, thinking about natural gas liquefaction or regasification projects in developing countries that are looking to transition away from coal or oil, uh, bunker oil in some cases and towards cleaner and more reliable sources of energy. So one of my favorite points of reference is that on average, every train of gas, liquefact gas liquefaction we, we build displaces, has the energy content capability to displace roughly six coal power plants from an electricity generating perspective. So if you're displacing or phasing out old coal plants, um, or in the developing world, it means that you're building new gas fired power plants instead of coal, which uh, you know, have significantly lower carbon contents, then it's not carbon free, but it's moving you closer towards carbon neutrality, which, which we think is an important transition. Um, so Vietnam is a really interesting real live market like this, where we're partnering with Exim and the rest of the US government to think about how can we help on liquefaction and regas and a gas to power supply chain there. Um, and of course, when agencies like Kim's help promote and facilitate these energy projects, it opens up whole new markets to American firms like ours, which instantaneously create jobs throughout the US, um, including down on the Gulf Coast right now, where some of our own developments are, are waiting for market conditions to shake out. Great, thank you. And I must say it warms my heart to hear you say, follow the data as the head of our analytics division. I couldn't agree with you more. So <laughs> absolutely 100%. And also to talk about the, the balance and the different opportunities that are out there. 
in Poland and also around the world for greater um, investment in clean energy and innovation. And you also raise a question or an issue about the competitive landscape globally and differences between state-owned enterprise-backed projects and also what the whole of government from the US and, and other um, countries around the world can provide. And so I'd like to dig into that a little bit more too, in the context of, of us being foreign policy and the landscape, competitive landscape that exists right now. And Kim, I'd like to turn this back to you. I know earlier this year, you submitted a competitiveness report to Congress on the credit export competitiveness landscape. And looking at the numbers and thinking about China specifically and the degree to which there's been significant investment abroad in critical infrastructure and energy infrastructure, I think to the tune of $76 billion in 2019. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the competitive landscape and how in this moment, how the US can really move forward and the role that XM can play in collaboration with private sector partners um, to compete abroad. You're speaking uh, 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 very uh, something very near and dear to my heart. Um, in the historic uh, XM reauthorization last December that extended us for seven years, Congress also gave us a brand new mandate, and that is to establish what I think is the most significant new program at XM in our history, and it's called the Program on China and Transformational Exports. So we know all about uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative China 2025. And uh, XM, uh, uh, we do an annual report. You can find it, as you mentioned, on our website. This is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I wonder why that's a woman here in the blocks instead of a guy. Uh, but, uh, but this shows how much export credit agencies around the world are doing to support their US, their, their companies, uh, companies, their country's companies and workers. And uh, we, we gather this data every year the best that we can. There are 115 um, export credit agencies in the world. And so you'll see that China is doing about the equivalent of what the G7 countries combined are doing. And they have two official export credit agencies and a lot of non-official um, activities. Um, and uh, uh, we in the, in the Trump administration are, are doing a whole government approach to that. So. Um, I'm, uh, if you look on the White House's website, I believe around uh, November 2nd, they published um, a book um, uh, edited by uh, NSA um, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien of um, the key speeches on China and uh, that, that have been made recently by Secretary Pompeo, the head of the FBI, the vice president, um, et cetera. And, uh, and we fold into that because our national security strategy um, lays out an important economic pillar. And we know that economic security is national security. And uh, Robert and Brian and I have spent a lot of time together being very thoughtful about this as we look at uh, the threat of China in China competition. And so this, this reauthorization of XM uh, says very plainly, XM, we want you to advance the America's comparative leadership in the world. And we also want you to neutralize China and we are giving you the permission uh, to match the terms, rates, and other conditions that China may be offering uh, to foreign purchasers of, of their goods. And so we're really working hard to raise awareness. I was um, at the Indonesian embassy in Washington uh, this morning uh, with uh, uh, Minister Hut and, uh, and La Hut and uh, the, the uh, embassy staff to, to help them understand we signed a $750 million MOU. And uh, uh, as we look at key, key segments around the world and key technologies. And so uh, we now have this new license to uh, match China's terms. Congress also asked us to focus on uh, 10 key sectors. And those are diverse transformational export sectors, including biotechnology, and I come from the world of food and agriculture right before I took on the role at XM. And so uh, I believe that that also includes food, food biotech, um, uh, biomedical sciences, uh, quantum computing, wireless communications, including 5G, um, uh, but also re uh, renewable energy and uh, uh, energy storage and, uh, and important um, other sectors uh, such as artificial intelligence and FinTech. 
And so we're working really hard now. Uh, the Weldy Lamont deal that I mentioned um, helped us uh, uh, displace China, but also the largest deal in Exim's history, uh, which we did last year. Uh, last year, we approved a $5 billion transaction uh, so that Mozambique would choose uh, the United States LNG equipment and services uh, to help them in Mozambique. And uh, that deal was slated for Russia and China until we uh, reopened the bank and um, we had the honor of voting on that. And, and uh, I had the honor of touching the equipment that actually will be exported to Mozambique uh, when I was down in Florida. So this new um, strong capability, Congress set a goal of at least 20% of what we can finance at any one time. Uh, Exxon has the capability to support $135 billion of authorizations at any one time. Congress wants us to do at least 20% or $27 billion of that on uh, this uh, China competition. And so it's really important for uh, foreign governments and, and minister, I'd love to, to have you call me someday and say, we really need the US to, to be in uh, submitting a bid. Uh, we need to know about the tenders. Uh, we need to help companies like Bechtel understand uh, those opportunities and, and it's a whole government approach. So we work closely with uh, uh, Wilbur Ross, Secretary Wilbur Ross is an ex officio member of Exim's board of directors along with uh, Ambassador uh, USTR uh, Robert uh, Lighthizer, but uh, the US Foreign Commercial Service, uh, the Advocacy Center led by um, Jose Cunningham over at Commerce and uh, 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 Undersecretary Keith Kroc over at State uh, who heads uh, with Commerce this deal team approach. But uh, we're really looking uh, forward to increasing awareness and bringing in more more opportunities for our companies, large and small. Thank you so much. And on that point, I'd like to turn one question back to Minister Anamsky before turning to our group questions. I know we have a bunch coming in, but on that point that Chairman Reed just made about collaboration and opportunities and awareness raising, I know that part of the collaboration agreement between the US and Poland has an explicit component about that, about raising awareness and cooperating on projects across Europe. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to that and what you, what you think can be be explicit ways that greater awareness and understanding of the importance of this kind of inter international collaboration can be and your priorities on that component of the agreement going forward. Uh, I really believe that uh, the basis uh, is a common understanding of uh, the uh, mutual interests. And uh, if there is such an understanding of mutual interest, everything is secondary. I mean, papers are secondary, agreements are uh, formal, agreements are secondary, even, even uh, agreement on money, <laughs> if I may say, is secondary. If the parties want, wants, want really to cooperate and achieve a common goal. And I... <clears throat> I really believe that there is a common ground for interests uh, uh, shared from one side uh, by uh, American companies and uh, on the other side by uh, uh, mean, uh, recipients uh, or, or uh, companies and countries which are willing to cooperate on an equal level with, uh, of course, but with uh, American uh, uh, companies and the government willing to, uh, if, once again, if I may say, uh, uh, comply with regional regulations, comply with regional uh, necessities, and able to compete, you know, uh, being able to compete with uh, uh, with others is uh, probably one of the crucial uh, uh, issues. And uh, you were talking about uh, about that, and uh, specifically in the nuclear sector, this is really uh, very important. So mutual trust, mutual trust is the basis. Perfect segue, thank you, um, absolutely agree. 
And I'd like to bring back Rich Powell to join our conversation now. We have so many questions that are coming in from the audience and I really want an opportunity for all of you to respond to those. So I'd welcome you back, Rich. And if all of you can stay to field some of these questions from the audience, um, there are a number of them. So thank you everyone in the audience for submitting your questions. And first and foremost, would like to get to a question about nuclear waste. We've had multiple questions coming in from the audience about that specifically. And so I really want to take the opportunity to address it here. And Rich, I'd like to turn this question over to you. There's been concern about nuclear waste certainly over the years and questions of, of varying um, varying kinds coming in with respect to this issue specifically. And so I'm wondering if you can speak to that and what advances have been made over the years with nuclear technology and how the public can be assured that there are ways to deal with and manage nuclear waste in a safe manner. Happy to address that. Let me just first say, I thought that this was a really inspirational discussion from, uh, from, from Chairman Reed, uh, who, who I, could, I could listen to all day as a, as a cheerleader for, for, for US industry and the positive role that our government can play. Uh, and from uh, uh, Minister Namsky and, 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 and the challenges he's facing uh, in, in you know, massive challenges in transitioning in the energy sector and just you know, how inspirational uh, everything that Brendan is doing with, uh, with Bechtel. So I'm just, I'm delighted to be here. You know, on, on the spent fuel issue, and I think it's best to think of this material as spent fuel or lightly used nuclear fuel. Clearly, we've had an issue in the United States with finding a permanent repository to put that fuel away somewhere. Uh, I actually think that there's a mixed blessing to that, which is that it really ought to be thought of as lightly used fuel. It has an enormous amount of energy still in that material and advanced technology every year is giving us more and more opportunity to find ways to reuse and reprocess that. This whole generation of advanced reactors that are gonna come online will we'll be able to use a lot of that spent fuel as their fuel going forward. And it's why innovation is so important. Things that looked like big problems in the past actually can be turned into big opportunities in the future. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, hey, Allison, um, sorry to interrupt. Could I just, could I add to Rich's comment? So um, uh, my perspective is a bit more technical probably. We're one of the leading, uh, we're one of the leading cleaner uppers of both weapons grade nuclear waste here in the US and abroad, um, as well as, um, you know, we've, we've in some way, shape or form designed or built or helped upgrade like 85% of the operating nuclear fleet in the US, including the, the only one currently under construction at Vogel in Georgia. Um, we also happen to be the, the engineering company that did the permit application for Yucca Mountain, which could be, and in my view, should be part of the permanent solution. Uh, I do think the questions are really important because I think that there is a, there's, there's a bit of a hanging chad of an issue around nuclear waste that until we can break free of that, there will always be an element of the discussion, uh, particularly in political circles that says, well, we gotta solve waste before we can do more nuclear energy. Personally, from a technical perspective, I would say, I think that's, it's a really, really important, uh, it's a really important uh, topic the science is pretty clear. It's we know we know how to design and engineer facilities to process and render this waste safe uh, for as long as it needs to be in that position. We know all the places where we could put it. Um, we have engineering solutions ready to go for that. It's really, frankly, a matter of political will. Uh, and so, you know, I would say I, I I do think broadly from a social license to operate perspective, uh, not dealing with uh, the the political topic of what's going to happen on the waste side. By the way, there's a huge portion of private industry that specializes in taking this lightly used fuel and rendering it safe and storing it at their facilities. You know, solutions exist. I just think it's sort of, um, we will forever be going around in circles on nuclear energy policy, which gets in the way of us moving towards carbon neutrality until there's a little more political will around this topic. Thank you for that. And I'd like to ask you a follow-up question specifically about that, because I think awareness obviously is, is such an important issue. And we have a question from Will Pollan at the United States Energy Association. And he asks, how can the US improve technology awareness and the technical support that can be provided? And it just speaks 
directly to what you were just saying. And so from your perspective, both in the US and internationally, as these projects are rolling out, how can greater awareness be raised about the possibilities to remediate and to deal with um, spent fuel and the safety issues that so many have concerns about? Yeah, I, I think there, there's, um, I don't have time to give, it, that's, there's like a tripartite answer to that. I think one is that um, the nuclear, the nuclear energy industry is unlike any other, you know, we serve pretty much every large industrial government or private sector industry that's out there that does stuff in the built environment. And the nuclear energy industry, uh, probably along with the oil and gas sector, but even more so the nuclear industry, it, it has the most robust culture around reporting of things that don't go right. And those lessons get shared very broadly, very quickly, and then incorporated into processes and procedures so they never happen again. And so if, if something bad has ever happened in the nuclear industry, everybody knows about it because they should. So we make sure it gets built into new design procedures and operating procedures and it never happens. So I would say first, everyone who's worried about this should realize that there's total transparency. Like, you, you, like it's impossible to hide stuff when it goes, even if you wanted to, which no one in the industry wants, you, you just couldn't do it. So I think having full transparency around the operations, the design standards, et cetera, for these, for these plants is really, really important. I also think educating the public about um, the level of design rigor and thoughtfulness and scenario. I mean, I worked, I worked on a nuclear outage changing out earlier in my career, changing out a steam generator replacement at a facility. And during the readiness review to rig out the old nuclear reactor um, to put in the new one, someone in the readiness review actually said, what happens if an asteroid strikes near the containment dome while you're rigging out the old generator. I mean, this is the length to which people, to which, you know, without being a smart aleck, I said, well, if an asteroid hits, we got all kinds of other problems we got to worry about. But it, the, the point is that, um, you know, there's so much discipline and rigor that a lot of people never see. And we do need to, we need to communicate that level of care and concern and technical knowledge that goes into it. And then the last point I was, I would make is that when we have successes in the industry, like we plan on having at Vogel when we complete it, and we prove not just the safety, but the economic benefits and the commercial viability of these technologies, whether it's, whether it's the Westinghouse AP1000 technology at Vogel or whether it's small modular reactors of which there are a bunch of solutions. You know, we need to trumpet these successes from the rooftops. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that. Thank you for the tripartite response. It's all so important. And each, each one of those pieces critical to moving all of these projects forward. And I'd like to now turn back to you, Chairman Reed, for a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, and thinking about going forward, next steps, and how to get more of these projects off the ground. You mentioned that there's a whole of government approach and the Trump administration has been very supportive of that approach. And so the question from this attendee is, how will change with the incoming Biden administration affect that? And what can be said about continuity? So I would say that um, the law for XM uh, speaks to what we have to do. And, uh, and so I can't speak for other agencies, um, but we have a bipartisan board of directors um, at XM and we are uh, uh, answerable to Congress on an annual basis, especially on this new program on China and transformational exports. So we do this annual competitiveness report that I show you and uh, they've given us some pretty uh, challenging and important uh, markers. And so as we set up this program on China, um, no matter um, who is the next chairman of XM, my, my term concludes by law on January 20th, uh, uh, but, uh, but whoever is chairman um, after me um, will need to be telling Congress, this is what we're doing, this is our strategy, and these are how we're really, um, the steps we're taking to bring more opportunities to the United States. Um, for XM, it is outreach, 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 I think, to raise uh, awareness. Um, it is uh, from small business um, to, to the largest. So uh, Brendan has participated uh, regularly in our annual XM conference where we moved to a virtual platform like everyone. And thank you for this virtual platform today, um, uh, this year. And uh, because of that, we went from a typical attendee 
uh, uh, amount of about 1,000 attendees to 1,700 attendees. And most of those were small businesses because think about how hard it is to leave your small uh, business. I was just out in um, Seattle uh, earlier this week. And when you go visit a, a small company, it's hard to go and learn about these opportunities um, that the government can help um, support. And so I think uh, 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 one of the outcomes of COVID that may be um, a new uh, change for all of us is, is helping to reach uh, through technology to, to every company um, in our country uh, in new ways. And that includes even startup uh, companies. So, so I would say um, uh, we have our, our, our goals and, uh, and, and we also wanna hear from companies and from, from foreign countries. So I really hope um, uh, uh, that we can continue conversations like this also through um, foreign policy. I can't thank you so much. You invited me to um, your Diplomat of the Year Award uh, last year where uh, uh, the NATO Secretary General uh, received the award and just engaging in topics like this to raise awareness that we are a tool in our nation's toolbox. And uh, XM is uh, demand driven. So you have to know to, you know, I wanna help you know about us and we want you to use us only if you need us. We want the private sector to be financing deals and providing the loans and the loan guarantees and uh, export credit insurance. But, but there is a role for us, particularly after uh, uh, the wake of, uh, in the wake of COVID, um, but for, for what's in the future, I hope that um, we are supporting billions and billions and billions of dollars more in U.S. exports. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your leadership. I would just like to say it's really an honor to have you here today for all of the work that you're doing, but also being the first woman in your role and the leadership that you've shown and continue to show for elevating um, U.S. companies and also small businesses. So we're running out of time, but if I could follow up with one quick question to you about that. I know you have supported small businesses and you mentioned that supply chain support that XM is providing. I think again now during COVID-19 um, and, and prior to support for small businesses is front and center of so many people's attention. And I'm just wondering, Going forward, what can be some of the opportunities and explicit areas where XM and other areas of the government can continue to support small businesses, small business innovation, particularly in clean energy going forward? Absolutely. And uh, um, uh, supply chain, you also mentioned, I was just in uh, Seattle yesterday and I visited um, a tool manufacturer called Pacific Tools. And they use um, XM through our supply chain financing program. They're part of the Boeing supply chain. And uh, with COVID and everything else that's happened, that company went from 150 employees to 75 employees. And uh, I was with them yesterday and saw the wonderful Made in the USA tools with Made in the USA steel um, that, that they're producing to help um, larger companies um, be successful. And, uh, and they, they told me uh, outright, if it wasn't for XM, uh, we would not uh, be the success uh, that we are. And uh, with COVID, that's, that's a time where we really come in and help our small businesses. Um, uh, we, we've honored this year um, 13 exporters of the year. It's, it's my pledge to visit um, in a safe way. All of them or have my fellow board members um, visit them and uh, present the awards uh, to them because um, if you look on our website, that's how you raise awareness. That's how you help small businesses get the courage to become uh, exporters. Um, also working with the community banks, working with, we just uh, established a relationship with um, the National Credit Union Administration headed by uh, uh, Chairman Rodney Hood and uh, the trade associations that, that work with credit unions across the country. Think about what it's like to be a small business and say, hey, 95% of the world's customers potential customers live outside our borders. I want to grow my business and I need to do this uh, by tapping into that. And how can I do that? And so we have a product called Export Credit Insurance that gives them the confidence in doing that. And so um, raising awareness um, is the big thing. Um, also, we have great partners with uh, the Small Business Administration and other, other agencies. But um, uh, Brendan, um, I would love to hear from you about how you work with uh, supply chains and uh, how um, we can really um, help do more outreach to, to help these, these small, small uh, the, I would say the lifeblood of our uh, country's economy. 
Great. I would love to hear that as well. Brendan, if we could turn <laughs> for the last Oh, word. I thought it was a rhetorical. Oh, great. I would love to also talk about that. <laughs> I, I'm just really glad you mentioned that, um, that that's part of Boeing supply chain, because I think the times that XM gets heat in, in the press is about you know, large company involvement. And the fact is that these larger companies in many cases are making multi-billion dollar procurements throughout their supply chain um, to small businesses. And that's, you know, that's obviously for a major construction project uh, in any kind of energy sector, whether it's renewables, nuclear, LNG, um, we're talking about anywhere from 500 to a thousand different suppliers on the project each of which in assembling their own components has huge downstream small business suppliers. Um, and so this is, this is one of the reasons why we partnered with Exum so much on projects all over the world. Um, and it's really, it's about bringing that supply chain opportunity back to the US. So things are made in the US um, and that's, that's what it's all about. So, you know, I think Kim, you, you, you framed it really, really well. Thank you for that. And thanks to all of you. We're unfortunately out of time, but I think so many really important concepts were raised today from all of you and the ways in which the public and private sector can and really need to work together going forward. So thank you, Chairman Reed. Thank you, Minister Nemsky. Brendan, thank you so much from your perspective from Bechtel and Rich as well from Clear Path um, and Senator Kramer as well. All of you today have really helped inform an enriching thought-provoking discussion about an issue that is so important to all of our futures. So thank you for that. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks thank for the you. opportunity. So thank you again to all of our speakers and to our audience for being here and for joining us for all of our virtual dialogues and those who are tuning in from all over the world. Um, please stay tuned for more of our upcoming events from FP, including one more virtual dialogue this week. We have one on Friday, November 20th, which will look at efforts that are underway to drive America's leadership in the space domain um, and how space-based capabilities are being used to support vital intelligence gathering in a time when traditional and on the ground intelligence gathering has been more difficult. So you're all welcome to join us for that and more conversations as we go forward in the fall and through the winter. So thank you all again for joining us today. You can find more about our events at foreignpolicy.com events. Thank you for tuning in. Take care and we'll see you soon. <laughs>